Hello and welcome back to Perspectives, bringing you our daily dose of news and views covering the topics we hope are relevant to you. Today, Narendra Modi in the United States. Well, we'll take a look at his visit, the reaction and how six have ensured his welcome may not have been quite so warm as he might have been expecting. Not least with a new Transnational Repression Act aimed at, hit, at India hitting the headlines just days before his arrival. And to add to Modi's woes, has Elon Musk decided India isn't for him either? And back in the Punjab, hunger strikes around the farmers' protest continue with another elderly farmer in a critical condition. Well, joining me, as always, for Perspectives is our very own correspondent in Canada, James Cousineau. Good morning, James. Good morning, Angus, and good morning to our amazing viewers out there. I hope you had a wonderful weekend, and thanks for coming back to join us on this beautiful Monday morning. And indeed, James and I together will be bringing you our perspectives on the daily news affecting the Sikh community across the world. And of course, as usual, we'll be taking a look at lots of your great comments which have been filling up below our videos. Thanks so much for those. But let's get the show on the road. James, what are you going to start us off with this morning? Well, Angus, as uh, you alluded to there in the intro, we are looking at whether or not it's been the kiss goodbye between uh, Tesla, Elon Musk and Prime Minister Modi. There were announcements earlier in the year, of course, that Elon Musk was looking to invest two to three billion dollars in India to develop a uh, an assembly and uh, manufacturing facility for the Tesla EVs. Now, since that time, a lot has changed. First of all, uh, earlier this spring, when Elon Musk was scheduled to actually travel and meet with Narendra Modi, at the last minute, he had cancelled that appointment and claimed that it had to do with pressing business issues. Now, just days later, though, he showed up to a meeting in China with the second in command of the government there. So it brought a lot of speculation as to where Elon Musk's uh, um, priorities are in the global expansion for Tesla and of course what games is he playing a game one off the other so you know it's not unheard of for him to play governments uh, at any level against each other to try and get what's best for him and potentially for his shareholders and of course we know that the government whether it's in India or China are going to play the same game because they want to get what's best for their people or with all of the uh, potential corruption of course what's best for them as individuals so it's an interesting uh, game that they're playing here but at the same time uh, we know that if it had to do with human rights concerns of Elon Musk that he wouldn't be talking to China either so it's really interesting to see how this bromance has really calmed down there was a lot of chatter amongst the two. There was uh, tweeting back and forth. And uh, as far as Elon Musk tw uh, tweeting out a congratulatory message to Narendra Modi as one of the top, um, one of the top po uh, world political leaders on X, formerly Twitter, in terms of followers, he also had tweeted out a congratulatory message to Narendra Modi when he won the last election and uh, said that he looked forward to bringing his businesses into uh, India. And of course, which Narendra Modi replied on the platform again, just saying that he looked forward to, you know, to this and thanked him for speaking out or, you know, just acknowledging him basically. So this seems to have calmed down though. As I said, there's been a lot of calming in the waters. The media is not covering it so much because Tesla is slowing down and putting the brakes on a lot of the global expansion. We don't know what the situation is because neither Tesla, Elon Musk or the India government is speaking right now about the halt or the hold on the Tesla plans. But we do know that they are looking at a market capitalization reduction as well as reduced uh, ability for capital expansion. A part of this, of course, could be uh, due to the delay in the full rollout of the Tesla truck. Of course, we know that there were delays in the Mexican plant uh, for manufacturing and assembly. This, of course, 
delayed with the facilities not being available, delayed the rollout of the truck, but also some other issues that have come up, and that is regulatory issues that Elon Musk and uh, Twitter are facing when it comes to markets in Brazil, as well as the U.S. Now, the SEC has been uh, trying to get Elon Musk in for questioning and before the panel to answer to a lot of their uh, concerns about the markets, about the shares, about a lot of different issues that uh, they are worried about whether or not they meet compliance or if he's coloring outside the lines once again. There are also concerns uh, in a court in Brazil where Elon Musk has been uh, ordered to appear before the courts and before the panel to talk and answer questions there. Again, he failed to show up for that uh, hearing as well and uh, claims that they do not have jurisdiction over him uh, or, you know, or his operations. So he is looking at getting tossed out of that country in terms of the availability of his platform. But of course, that's going to have a direct connection to Twitter uh, or sorry, to Tesla and to SpaceX and his other uh, industries. And that could be a concern of not only China, but also India, uh, because they have a record of foreign interference. And they, although they do not at this time allow Twitter in their country, that's a matter of investment. And a lot of social media platforms are investing in India's own infrastructure when it comes to social media platforms that are built and maintained within the country. So if they are piggybacking on the X platform, uh, the Facebook platform or any other, of course, we're going to be looking at the same concerns that the U.S. regulators and the U.S. government had when it came to TikTok. And that, of course, was privacy, spying and other technological uh, and national security concerns. This is really playing out to be a long game. We don't know exactly what is going on in terms of Tesla's expansion in India, but we do know that the brakes have basically been applied at this time and slowed right down. The bromance between Modi and, uh, and Musk seems to have died down. Whether they will in the future kiss and make up, we don't know. But what we do know is that there's only a 1.5% market cap for the electric vehicles in India. Only 1.5% of electric vehicle sales in the entire market of vehicle sales there. The interesting part is that China is willing to open up the technology for self-driving vehicles and autonomous vehicles to operate on roads in China, which of course has been a platform that Musk has been promoting and really has uh, pushed his share price on and hedged his bets uh, on getting that really out there and launched and seeing success in that. And India is far away from uh, being able to, uh, to welcome autonomous driving vehicles as well as infrastructure for charging is also another big issue in India that's going to have to be addressed. Once more, we come back to whether or not India is open to just having Tesla in there, considering that they have two major Indian companies that are building EVs and are slowly making progress. But again, this will give them more time to build their market share in the Indian market before Tesla gets in there and tries to, uh, uh, you know, like he did in North America, for example, where he led the way in sales, in technology, and of course, in a lot of headaches for drivers, but we won't get into that. So we just got to wait and see where that goes. Now, the other downside, of course, of the withdrawal or the hold on this were all of the people in India that are impacted by the potential that they may have had some very good jobs, some secure jobs in the technology, not only with the building of the Tesla vehicles and the manufacturing process, but also the technology, because technology drives the Tesla, plain and simple. And of course, that goes to the AI, to the robotics, to, you know, just about all all of the different aspects that go into it, which is, of course, another area that Elon Musk is hedging his bets for future profitability and really rapid growth over the next five and 10 year period, and that is AI and robotics. So he's really hedging his bets on several of these technologies, but 
now it seems that uh, it's not going to happen in India, and we have to wait and see how Modi and the government reacts to that, but uh, or if it gets put on again. But for now, it just looks like the uh, bromance is over Angus, and we don't know where that market's going to land. Yeah, uh, Elon Musk is a very shrewd uh, operator. He has a lot of critics, and um, yeah, I think a lot of people are ready to sort of tear him down at the first opportunity. But you've got to hand it to this guy. Apart from the fact he's one of the richest men on the planet, he knows uh, he knows how to play the game. And I, I think the reading between the lines here is clearly playing India off against uh, China, two of the world's largest potential markets. Um, yeah, he's obviously very, very keen to get his uh, vehicles, his electrical vehicles into both of those markets. And I'm sure one day he probably will. Of course, what he's up against is, um, I mean, uh, to buy a Tesla, you're looking at $100,000 plus. Uh, and, and certainly, I mean, they are very popular here in the UK, as indeed they are over in, uh, in North America. But at the end of the day, they are uh, they're quite a, an unaffordable item for, for many people in our society, in our relatively wealthy societies. Now, in China and India, where the cost of living, the whole uh, economic benchmarks are several steps lower, he's going to struggle if uh, to, to, you know, a car that is manufactured, well, wherever it's manufactured, but it's certainly going to be not a cheap car to manufacture. Um, so it's, its cost base is going to be very high. And of course, he's going to be competing against the local EV manufacturers and indeed the local fossil fuel manufacturers um, whose cars are a fraction of the price. Now, both India and China both have um, burgeoning middle classes, all of them looking to, uh, you know, to improve their lives by getting to EVs. And certainly the, there's the brand uh, benefit of driving a Tesla. But ultimately, um, if you're faced with a $100,000 Tesla or something locally grown, uh, that's uh, maybe even a quarter of the price, it's not a difficult decision to make. Now, uh, the difference between India and China, I've worked a lot in China, I've spent quite a lot of time in China, and one thing I would say about China, in terms of certainly the EV market and the technology market, they are very mature. In fact, I would go as far as to say they are one of the most advanced societies and technologically integrated societies on the planet. I think people in the West don't realise just how far advanced China is. Of course, there is the IP issue here, as you rightly pointed out, James, that uh, any Western manufacturer and many, um, well, I'd say most Western manufacturers are desperate to get into the Chinese market, but it always comes with a price. That, of course, is uh, the protection of IP and the, uh, the regular occurrence of IP just happening to leak out and being uh, copied locally in China. Now, China has uh, stamped down very hard on this, or at least on the face of it. There are huge regulations in China to try and prevent this IP theft. And it has been, uh, it has been successful to some, to some extent, but it does still go on. <coughs> Excuse me. So, of course, Elon Musk is going to be very concerned about this. But in reality, Tesla is up against some very mature, very successful EV manufacturers in China. Um, he's going to struggle, I think. The only, the only thing working in his favour is the fact that it's the brand. It's the Tesla brand. And the Chinese love Western brands. Um, for some reason, they really, it really holds a lot of cachet, particularly uh, the very high-end brands. So that's, I would say that it probably is his overriding marketing advantage in China. In India, is that the case? I think it is to some degree. But India is, in my opinion, way behind in the EV manufacturing market. I think they, they've got a long way to, a lot of ground to cover to even catch up with China. Um, now, is there a market in India for, uh, for Teslas? Again, same, same problem. Uh, how much is a Tesla going to cost in India? Yes, a huge rising uh, middle class in India. But again, cost of living in India is that much lower than in the West. So it's going to be t uh, the margins are going to be difficult to justify if he's going to sell his cars in India. The social media market, well, that's a whole different ball game. We do know that, uh, I mean, what are the similarities between China and India? They both very powerfully control social media. They don't like any anti-government messages going out. Of course, Elon Musk, the owner of X, um, he's come up, up against this in both China and India. Um, so one wonders what deals are going on behind the scenes. I suspect that uh, uh, Elon Musk is doing some pretty hard deals, and I suspect he is selling out his principles. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, it's yeah, I think it's not it's not unfair to guess. He probably is selling out some of his public principles in private just to get the deal done. So I think uh, in both China and India, I think he will eventually penetrate both markets. I think he will struggle. And I think he particularly will struggle in India. 
where uh, I think, yeah, there is a, a, a relatively smaller EV manufacturing base, but it is rising. And I think it's only a matter of time before they compete against Tesla. So, um, yeah, it, well, I think only time will tell on this one, James. I think it's uh, I think it's a tough one. All I know is that uh, all I can guess is that Elon Musk will be playing China against against India behind the scenes. Who's going to win? I think they'll both win in the end. I think both are potential superpowers. Uh, but I think ultimately Musk is going to struggle against homegrown EV manufacturers. They're both entrepreneurial countries. I think uh, in reality, we will see the rise of the Indian Tesla uh, not before long. Absolutely. And a lot of the profits of Tesla in the U.S. market come in form of uh, energy credits because of the fact that they are producing electric vehicles. Non-electric vehicle manufacturers have to pay into the environmental credits, which, of course, uh, Elon Musk and Tesla reap a massive, massive benefit in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So you also have to look at these varying uh, parts of the business that really might be impacted if they do expand to China or India. Uh, so again, there's just so many pieces at play for the international expansion. We'll also have to wait and see how the U.S. federal election plays out because I think that could have some impact on the decisions that Musk makes in terms of global uh, reposition, global expansion, and the global marketplace. So we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. And, uh, of course, with that, my personal opinion is that he's going to be, in the next five years, he's not going to be controlling Tesla. I think he'll be focused on X, and uh, somebody else will step in to take Tesla to the next level. But, again, that's just my personal opinion, so don't put any stock on that whatsoever. Uh, but in that case, let's move on, Angus, and uh, let's take a look at the next story as we're going to run out of time if we don't. And of course, this next story, we're talking about the uh, strike by India's farmers. Yet once again, we are seeing uh, the escalation of people getting ill. And uh, one individual, an elderly, well, they call him elderly. I don't want to admit that he is because he's only in his early 60s. And, you know, we're all pushing that. So I don't want to say elderly at that age. Uh, but let's get serious here and take a look here. Now, the hundreds of farmers that are protesting along the borders uh, with India, of course, have been tilling this land for decades and decades since partition for some of them. Now, what's happening is that with a new proposed change, they are no longer allowed to till this land, to use this land for agriculture, and to be able to use that to feed their families and to make an income. With these changes, of course, there's been protests, and they started on July the 13th in front of the DAC, or the District Administrative Complex, and of course, that followed when the uh, escalation took place to a hunger strike. Since that time, the hunger strike has resulted in the death of several farmers, and most recently, the hospitalization of another farmer who is 63 years old. He was pro in protest uh, since, I believe it was August, that he started his hunger to, uh, strike as well. And he is a 63-year-old by the name of Dara Singh. Now, the government came in, emergency workers uh, came in because he was uh, quite sick and feeling the effects of the hunger strike, his body, of course, breaking down due to the lack of nutrition and food, and they forced him into a hospital. Uh, once he was at the hospital, he was treated and transferred to a, another facility, the Ames Bethinda. Uh, but again, he took a turn for the worse. He's now in critical condition, has been transferred back to the civil hospital once again. Now, this is an ongoing issue, of course, with the hunger strike. The concerns are uh, very real and very desperate for the farmers who are on the hunger strike because the government just seems to want to wait them out and then either they will die or they will get gravely ill like this individual and they'll clear them out that way but they are not giving in terms of making any changes to allow them to continue to, to farm this land that's between uh, the borderline and the uh, and the barbed wire chain link fences and they've been doing it since 1947 and possibly or probably long before that as well so with the imposition of section 145 it now restricts that movement it restricts their 
uh, personal uh, sustenance in terms of their personal food that they gain from this, but also in terms of the food that they put out on the market to help them survive and to provide a living. And even if it is a very small uh, source of revenue, it is enough for them to at least dis to just scramble to get by as a community. And the, the importance of community is so much stronger now, when they all stand together like they are in this protest. So again, the uh, farmers claim the border, uh, the offense went up around 1989. They've been farming even, as I said, long before that, and they've been farming since the offense went up. It really is a question of why all of a sudden this seems to be such a hotbed topic for the government and why they can't give them the respect and the rights that they have been experiencing for all of these decades and just let them go on as a community to be as one, to come together and to practice what they've been practicing and teaching their children and that their grandfathers taught them and, you know, the generations it's really too bad that it seems that the governments, uh, not only in India, but other countries as well, want to basically take away the historic and cultural richness of so many communities and so many faiths, so many cultures. And, uh, you know, you, we talk about this, about uh, things that happen in Punjab, Angus, and other parts of India where they're trying to ban certain languages and other uh, cultural, importantly, uh, or significant issues of importance all the way around. Yeah, it's uh, yet again, it's just another battle in this war against the farmers, particularly Punjabi farmers. Um, I mean, on the face of it, yeah, this this land is yeah has, has fallen foul of of, uh, of a larger scale legislation. It's part of a border area, and uh, clearly, central government have dictated right. This is this land is is unusable. It's not to be used. It's essentially to mark a border. In reality, uh, the people who are tilling this land, they are just local, lowly farmers. They're, uh, they're no threat to anybody. They are literally living a subsistence level. And even if there is any uh, profitable um, agriculture taking place, it, it literally is just going to be the tiniest levels. It is not in any level that's going to have any impact outside just literally the locality. So it's, um, it does, uh, it just smacks of unreasonableness. And... Yeah, uh, it, it can probably be justified legally, as many of these uh, many of these things certainly always seem to be by by Delhi. In reality, it's a human story, and there is no compassion. There's no uh, there, there is no um, there's no empathy at all coming from Delhi. At least of all, because of course it's Punjabi farmers. Of course, since when has Delhi had any any empathy towards Punjabi farmers? Quite the opposite. It's it's like any any possibility to stamp down on Punjabi farmers, they go ahead and do it. Um, but as I say, these are just little local farmers who are just literally trying to make it, not even just make a living, they're just trying to put food on their own tables. So, yeah, it's, uh, it is unfortunate um, that uh, it's, again, just another sign of central government imposing their, their diktats on Punjabi farmers. And all, it, all it's doing is just once again generating... Uh, a dislike, hatred even towards New Delhi from the Punjab. It's alienating the Punjab when in fact Delhi, if it really wants to assimilate the Punjab into its uh, Hindu Rashtra, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to do quite the opposite. It can't uh, start upsetting or start. It's been upsetting Punjabis for decades, if not centuries. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's certainly not winning the hearts and minds of Punjabis by doing things like this. So, again, all it's doing is just alienating uh, people from the Punjab once again. And all it's doing is, is increasing support for an independent nation. These Punjabi farmers, I have absolutely no doubt, given the option, will say, you know what, we don't want Delhi. We don't want to be ruled uh, from so far away. We want our own uh, regional government. We want a government that actually understands our issues, our own government that will let us till our little parcel of land. That's it's very simple to me, James. Absolutely. And if there's anybody out there watching in the region on a VPN, by all means, send our best wishes to Mr. Dara Singh and tell him that uh, we're, 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 rooting, we're rooting for him to come back to good health. And how often is it that we have to report on these terrible stories of, uh, of, of local farmers, local people on hunger strikes just simply for their basic human rights? That's how desperate people have got in this region 
just to even get their voices heard, is they have to resort to literally threatening their own lives just to even get heard. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good look. The optics are not great for Narendra Modi's India if he's, uh, if he's trying to sell his country on the world stage. But that does indeed very conveniently lead on to my first story, which of course is Narendra Modi on the world stage. Narendra Modi has visited the United States and he's been welcomed by President Biden, no less. Uh, this is part of Narendra Modi's world tour since uh, uh, winning his third term, only just scraping his third term um, into uh, Indian governance. Now, uh, he was actually in the US as part of the Quad meeting. Now, the Quad made up of India, Japan, Australia. And uh, this Quad exists as a, as a regional alliance, um, just uh, on, on many levels, but primarily economic, but also strategic as well. And US President Joe Biden met with the leaders of Japan, India and Australia. Um, uh, for many reasons, and on the face of it, to discuss regional issues. But in reality, a lot of it was to discuss the challenges from a rising China that's posing uh, potential risk and threat to, to their respective countries. And the talks in Wilmington reflect the importance that uh, Biden has placed on these so-called quad countries, uh, particularly as a counterweight to Beijing. And, uh, and actually, interestingly, uh, Biden did host uh, uh, Premier uh, Kishida, Japan's Prime Minister, and Narendra Modi at his own home in the city for private one-on-one -on -one meetings on Saturday. Unfortunately, the media were given no access to these meetings. And Biden did then post pictures on social media of himself with Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, and Kishida in his house. Now, the White House said in uh, uh, afterwards that meetings with the Australian and Japanese leaders, they had discussed their shared, shared concerns about China, and China's coercive and destabilizing activities, particularly in the South China Sea. Both statements also said that the leaders backed maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Of course, a Taiwan issue, uh, as many say, is the potential lead up to World War III, heaven forbid. So, um, but there have been no immediate statements on Modi's talks with Biden. They've been very tight-lipped, much to everyone's frustration. Of course, China will be high on the agenda, at this summit against the uh, backdrop of tensions with Beijing, and particularly over a series of recent confrontations between China and Philippine, Filipino vessels in, uh, in uh, some very hotly disputed areas in that South China Sea. Um, the Quad itself does date back to 2007, uh, but Biden is actually the first to set up a leaders' summit and has strongly pushed it as part of his emphasis on an international alliance after the isolationist, or what they call the isolationist Trump years. US officials play down any risk to the grouping uh, if uh, and whoever wins the elections come this November. So basically what they're saying is even if Trump uh, wins the presidency in November, that uh, the, uh, the grouping, the quad grouping, will still, uh, will still maintain its significance and still continue as a group. And uh, for the United States, Australia and Japan, the Quad is also a long-term courtship of India. New Delhi has historically been insistent on its non-aligned status when it comes to contests between superpowers. So again, there is the strategic purpose behind the Quad. Uh, that's where the US, Australia and Japan are still trying to win India alongside to help buttress against uh, a growing China. Now, <coughs> that's, the, that's the public face of what's been going on with uh, Narendra Modi in the US. But of course, uh, 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 what will be quite unwelcome to Narendra Modi and has actually been reported widely across social media is that uh, before Modi's visit, senior US officials actually met with sick advocates a couple of days before his arrival to discuss threats facing Sikhs in the United States, including, of course, the failed uh, fail plot on Gurpatran Singh Panin. Now, the meeting with uh, senior White House and US intelligence officials came only two days before Biden himself met personally with Narendra Modi. Now, the, the US has, of course, been pushing India to investigate the uh, murder plot against uh, Gurpatran Singh Panoon and, of course, by extension, the Najjar case. Um, now, the officials briefed a group of Sikh advocates about the government's ongoing conversations with India in a closed-door meeting organised by the National Security Council. Biden, we do know, had this one-on-one -on -one discussion with Modi on Saturday uh, about the Quad primarily. 
But India has featured prominently in Washington's stepped-up diplomacy to deepen strategic partnerships aimed at countering the influence of China and Russia. Now, while the US has expressed concern over the sick incident, it has so far emphasised the importance of the relationship with New Delhi, given, of course, their shared security interests, of course, with China in mind. Senior US officials on Thursday sought to assure the Sikh community that Washington remained committed to protecting Americans from active transnational repression. They also provided an update on efforts by US law enforcement to educate local police about the threats and to encourage Sikhs to report any threats or harassment. And according to Pritpal Singh, he is the founder of the advocacy group, the American Sikh Caucus Committee, one of the main attendees of this meeting. And he said after the meeting, yesterday, we had the chance to thank senior federal government officials for saving lives of Sikh Americans and for vigilance in protecting our community. Now, basically, the upshot of these, uh, of these all these sort of statements and releases across various media outlets, <coughs> let's just summarise, is that Narendra Modi has met President Maiden. Prior to that meeting, uh, Sikh organisations met privately with uh, senior officials of the of US uh, of the White House and US intelligence. So we don't know, of course, yet what went on behind closed doors. We do know that meeting between uh, the US officials and the Sikh caucus uh, committee, etc. Um, clearly, we know what was on that agenda. There's no secret about what that will be about. And interesting that, uh, and, and actually would say very encouraging that US officials have actually uh, invited this meeting. They've, they've listened to the Sikh community. So clearly, they are firstly very concerned about what's been happening. And secondly, they are, they're wanting to know what is the message that we need to give to Narendra Modi. And I, I have no doubt that the, the Sikh representatives will have given both barrels, so to speak, to say, this is what you must raise with Narendra Modi. Now, in turn, Biden met, met, met uh, Modi in private. We don't know yet what was discussed. The question is, did Biden have on his agenda with Modi all what was discussed in this prior meeting? I'm sceptical. It's very clear that Biden's administration, on the, certainly on the face of it, have been very appeasing of Narendra Modi. We've criticised Biden's administration regularly because he's clearly on the face of it more interested in uh, the China issue and trying to win Narendra Modi as an ally is, is going to be uh, very reluctant to uh, hit Modi with the human rights issues. He's going to be very reluctant to bring up the whole Gurpant Singh Panoon issue because it's an uncomfortable truth that might taint those otherwise uh, huge um, overt um, appeasement messages to Narendra Modi. So I think there's a two-tiered approach going on here. I think the US senior officials will be telling their Indian counterparts, look, guys, this has got to stop. The transnational oppression has got to stop because it's really souring this relationship. I think Biden is a bit more of a coward. One also has to question his, uh, his um, cognitive abilities to take on somebody shrewd and as sharp as Narendra Modi. I've absolutely no doubt that that meeting, fr meeting frankly, will be a complete waste of time. I think that is more, um, more about optics. I think that is more about um, higher level issues, strategic issues. And I think Bo Biden will be on his metaphorical knees to Modi, say, look, please come on side. We want you on side. Um, and I think beneath uh, Biden, there will be more senior officials, more, um, more, more less politically motivated, but more actually strategically motivated officials who will be saying, for God's sake, we've got to do something about transnational repression. Yes, we do need to keep India on side, but we cannot uh, sacrifice our human rights principles um, upon which we've justified basically uh, several inv invasions of sovereign countries, um, that we've got to be firmer with Narendra Modi. So I think, again, there's this, um, there's this almost schizophrenic approach to India, where one part of uh, the American administration is saying, look, we cannot sacrifice our democratic principles. But on the other hand, the other voice is saying, look, we've got to tie up India as an ally because we are scared of China. China is a real and present danger to the modern world. It is a destabilizing country to, uh, to what potentially may happen. We refer to, to Taiwan already. Um, uh, China clearly has its eyes on Taiwan. That is a trigger point that potentially could trigger World War III because it's very clear China has said overtly, we will take China. It doesn't matter what it costs, we will, sorry, we will take Taiwan. The West has said, if you take Taiwan, then all bets are off. We will not let you take Taiwan. So both sides very aware of that issue. So um, there's a lot, a lot of issues there at stake, James. Um, but the one good thing is that the Sikh community have managed to get their voice right to that very top table in those discussions.
Absolutely. And I, I totally agree with you on the fact that with Biden uh, basically one foot out the door of the White House, uh, whether or not he was going to rattle any cages or uh, try to play any politics when it came to uh, these issues that are of such importance, whether it be foreigners who are arbitrarily detained or whether it's the foreign interference and, you know, all of these other very important issues. And the other uh, question is whether or not Modi will meet with Trump before he leaves the U.S. Because there is rumor that they are going to be meeting after uh, after the four day event with the other leaders. So we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. That could be a benefit. It could be a drawback. We don't know what's going to be discussed or what rumors are going to be brought out of such meetings or what the uh, potential for rumors of interference, of course, could come out of uh, Trump and Modi meeting before the election. So it's going to be interesting to really watch how the rest of his trip plays out in America there, Angus. Yeah, it, it's, it is. I mean, admittedly, it's a very difficult situation for the, uh, for the U.S. administration because, of course, they do need India as an ally, strategically speaking. But at the same time, uh, you know, they've, uh, they, they do have this, uh, they've got to be tougher with Narendra Modi. But if they are tougher with Narendra Modi, there is the danger that they push him back towards Russia. Um, and that, uh, uh, well, Russia at the moment is the, the present bogeyman, and they certainly don't want to be pushing India into the arms of Russia. So yeah, it's um, uh, lots of balls up in the air in that one. We'll see how they land. And we will, of course, follow that story. And as any announcements or leaks uh, manage to filter out from those meetings, we will then, of course, report on those. But it does actually lead on to my second story, which is, of course, um, deeply linked to this. And this is, um, uh, there's been, I, I talked about a two-tier a, a two situation in the, in the US administration, the US government. Because actually, whilst uh, Biden has on the face of it appeared pretty weak uh, in terms of what's been going on with transnational repression and, and how he's dealt with India so far, there has actually been a very hard core of congressmen and senators um, who have been extremely active uh, on behalf of the Sikh community and particularly on human rights and the whole transnational repression situation. And uh, there have been, on both sides actually, it's been a cross-party um, effort actually. There have been many in the Democrat Party, many in the Republican Party who have stood up quite vocally um, against what's been going on across North America and across the diaspora, particularly targeting the Sikh community. And they have actually been working extremely hard uh, to raise, uh, firstly, awareness, but secondly, to introduce legislation, to introduce bills into Congress, to start taking this whole matter seriously. And we have to take our hat off to uh, Adam Schiff, who's a Democrat congressman for California, California. And he has just successfully introduced the Bipartisan Transnational Repression Reporting Act of 2024, which will now require the Attorney General, in coordination with other relevant federal agencies, to submit a report of cases of transnational repression against US citizens or people in the United States. And of course, this does come after what happened to, uh, particularly to Gurpan Thang Singh Panoon. And uh, 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 Republican uh, Senator, uh, sorry, Congressman Schiff has said, with transnational repression on the rise, the American people deserve to know if foreign governments are working to intimidate, harass, harm or kill individuals within the US whom they view as hostile to their regimes. My bill will require a comprehensive report on cases of foreign governments targeting individuals here at home and American citizens abroad. Now, according to the FBI, the most common targets of transnational repression are political and human rights activists, dissidents, journalists, political opponents and members of religious or ethnic minority groups. Well, there's no surprise there. Methods of transnational repression may include physical and digital stalking, harassment, computer hacking, criminal threats, assaults, attempted kidnappings, coerced repatriation, and interestingly, detaining family members in the home country. This is really, really important language because of course, we've often reported on many of these incidents against the Sikh community, but the one most insidious one that we do have to report regularly on is this detaining family members in the home country. That is seen as transnational repression, which is really going to quite upset India because of course, that's one of their main uh, tactics to intimidate and harass uh, particularly Khalistani activists in North America, both in Canada and the US, um, and of course here in the UK, and of course in Australia, is that family members back in the Punjab are intimidated and harassed by local law enforcement. So that is a huge step forward in the United States. Now this bill 
has actually been um, has is in, has has been co-sponsored by a Congressman Goldman, Congresswoman Omar, Congressman McGovern, Congressman Eric Swalwell, whose name has appeared regularly. He's been a fantastic advocate for what's been going on. Congresswoman Lee and Congresswoman Norton, all Democrats across the US from the east to west coast. And uh, the proposed legislation will establish clear requirements for the US government to gather information about and publicly report actions taken to address all reported instances of transnational oppression. It also specifically centers, among other examples, India's recent targeting of Sikh activists. The bill is in part an effort to address the lack of transparent and concrete action in response to India's and other countries' behaviour. So yeah, this will legally oblige all entities, all uh, government and legal entities, to report publicly what they what they are doing about any acts of transnational oppression. So you, they can't bury it, they can't hide it under the carpet just for um, diplomatic reasons or um, you know because it happens to be uncomfortable if out in the public domain. They will now have this obligation to report these things, which is a fantastic move. So as a reminder, the US government has not moved to hold India directly accountable, nor have they imposed economic or diplomatic consequences on India like other nations, including Canada and Australia. So yeah, absolutely, this is a huge step forward um, in pushing the, uh, the US administration into acknowledging the fact that it exists and they must start taking action against it. So of course, unsurprisingly, the reaction for the Sikh community has been really, really, really strong and uh, very positive. The Sikh coalition who've been heavily involved in this, they said, we are deeply grateful to Congressman Schiff for proposing this legislation and taking the continuing threat of TR, um, including India's recent targeting of Sikhs seriously. Now it is crucial that Sangat members urge their representatives to make a strong bipartisan show of support for this proposal. And they continue to say, advising Congressman Schiff's office on this legislation is just one aspect of the Sikh Coalition's advocacy work on repression. We've also briefed federal agencies, members of Congress and state legislators, supported and consulted on additional federal and state legislation, organised letters from members of Congress, civil rights organisations and gurdwaras, and published our own independent report. So many targets, which details the scope of Indian transnational repression against the Sikh community. This highlights that it works, that members of our audience, when you get involved in these things, when you pressure your members of uh, your local parliaments, your local uh, representatives and government, it works. The message does filter up that chain. And the more people that do it, the more powerful, the stronger that message is. This is a sign that the Sikh organisation's pressure and lobbying is really working. They've managed to introduce this incredible piece of legislation. So let that be a lesson to all of us. It does work. Lobbying and pressure does work. Now, the Sikh Assembly of America, likewise, um, their reaction has been very positive. Um, they, of course, have reported about uh, many acts of transnational oppression. Um, Sikh activists, of course, were killed in the Punjab, Pakistan and the UK as well, as, the, as they have highlighted. Indian diplomats interfered, for example, in the state of Connecticut and other states by condemning Sikh acknowledgements by General Assembly and committing defamation of the Sikh community, Sikh flag and Sikh history on record. I would actually refer you to um, a podcast I did some months ago with Swaranjit Singh Khalsa. Um, he was a guest who is a very high achieving gentleman in Connecticut, in Norwich in Connecticut. And I had a fascinating uh, podcast, a discussion with him some months ago. Do look back through our channel for that podcast. Um, because he highlighted some of the incredibly shocking <laughs> activities that India has been going on behind the scenes through many of their, uh, I call them the tales of the serpent, many of their, um, their little local outlets across, uh, across America, across the US particularly, um, designed that their modus operandi is to bury, suppress any sick um, any, anything that promotes the Sikh, or, uh, or, uh, the Sikh organization, the Sikh community. And uh, Soranjit highlighted many instances where they had been particularly trying to bury any, uh, any highlighting of the Sikh genocides of 1984 and what India got up to in 1984. Anyway, so um, uh, Soranjit is, is actually, uh, I think, one of the key members of the Sikh Assembly of America. I'll come on to that in a second. Um, a, a large number of diaspora communities have experienced a rise of incidents of intimidation, harassment, or in some cases, violence. However, transnational oppression against the US persons or persons in the US appears to be on the rise, particularly from India, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and China. 
And uh, the Sikh Assembly of America took a lead on this matter and briefed over 200 US congressional members about how India is committing transnational oppression and also highlighted Sikh demand for self-determination, of course, Khalistan, which has gained more traction after these incidents and plots to kill Sikh activists. So, of course, the Sikh Assembly of America, another hugely powerful organization, again, through grassroots lobbying, has been successful in helping this bill to happen. Now, Swaranjit himself, he actually, uh, he is, as, as I mentioned, a local elected official in Connecticut. He is one of the directors of Sikh Assembly of America. And he said of the transnational, um, uh, transnational repression uh, bill coming in, uh, he said, Connecticut has also witnessed transnational repression in the hands of India on different occasions, but we believe in the Constitution of America that surpasses their influence and political intimidations. I do stress that stronger laws are made in this country to combat transnational repression, and we are lucky to have state and federal delegations that feel that way as well. India must be made accountable for transnational repression on six. And this bill helps combat the oppression and intimidation Sikhs are facing in, in America. Well said, Swaranjit. Now, of course, uh, I will maybe report separately, but uh, India media has been working absolutely overtime over the last few days. Um, firstly, about Narendra Modi's visit. Secondly, about the fact that uh, US officials met with Sikh organizations prior to Narendra Modi's visit. They were appalled, shocked, horrified, rattled. And you only need to look at Indian media. They've been trotting out all sorts of uh, narratives to try and counter the fact that how dare the US administration actually meet with Sikh representatives. They're horrified by this. They realize the danger that this poses, firstly to Narendra Modi, secondly to the BJP, the RSS, and of course, what is going on in India, the abuse of human rights. Secondly, also, what is going on, what the RSS and the BJP have been up to across the diaspora, the transnational oppression. So you only need to look at uh, Indian social media and Indian mainstream media. They're trotting out things about, uh, oh, links to Pakistan. Oh, uh, they're, they're linking anybody um, who's, who's standing up uh, across the Americas. Um, the, their links to Pakistan, they've been meeting with Pakistan leaders, etc. Again, they're trying to undermine anybody who dares to stand up, particularly in these sick organizations. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's very encouraging, I would say, to see um, that the Indian media are frothing at the mouth at this. They're horrified, which means it's working. It means the Sikh community across the diaspora are having a massive impact. It does mean that the movement towards Khalistan is gaining yet more momentum. It does mean that the US administration is taking not just the Sikh community more seriously and the threat of transnational repression. It means they must therefore, by implication, be taking the right to self-determination more seriously, which means that the US administration is starting to recognize the potential for Khalistan. James, there is a lot going on, a lot of movement. This is, uh, these are signs of things to come, I feel. Well, and I think that the timing is really important as well. Again, we brought up earlier about the uh, pending US election. So I think it's sending a clear message out there that, you know, there's the ball may be already rolling for some foreign interference in the next election, but I don't think that we're going to see it at a level that it's really going to have a play uh, one way or the other for either party or benefit. But I think it sends a clear message for future elections and the protection of all U.S. citizens, whether they're on U.S. soil or on foreign soil, that the U.S. is not going to allow this continued interference and, uh, and, and harassment of anybody. That's whether it is at the hands of India, whether it's at the hands of China or any other foreign nation that it's just not going to be accepted anymore. And this is really going to add a level of transparency to make sure that diplomatic channels are not used to cover it up. So I think this is a huge, huge announcement that uh, I hope other countries will follow suit. Yeah, so uh, all, all credit to Congressman Schiff and his co-sponsors for bringing in that bill, uh, but also well done to the sick organisations who have clearly had a massive impact, huge efforts which have now paid dividends. So well done to them. So great, that's a, a great story to finish on. Okay, let's, uh, let's rush on as time marches on. Let's rush on to our comments section. And uh, the first comment, it has to be an apology from me. Unfortunately, I've made a mistake because Jaspal Chatterfall 
makes the comment. Sorry, just a correction. It was against Bhagwan Man, not Simranjat Singh Man. My apology. Yes, I did uh, confuse the two uh, Mr. Mans uh, on this, of course. Bhagwan, the chief minister of Punjab, Simranjit, of course, the president of the Shiromani Akali Dal. Two very different people with two very different uh, contexts and agendas behind them. So my apologies for that and thank you for pointing that out. It was a silly slip of the tongue. Uh, but I would actually just add to this comment. Um, somebody else did actually correct me as well. And for the life of me, I cannot find that other comment. Somebody else, uh, you know who you are. You did make this comment to correct me. Thank you for that. And when I was uh, putting this together, I looked for your other comment to, to put that up on here as well. But it's disappeared. Now, it may be that I'm just not looking in the right place. But I cannot find that comment, which then leads on to a comment somebody's just made, I think, this morning, that one of their comments has disappeared, which James raises his whole spectre once again. Are comments disappearing? Clearly they are. Quite concerning. As long as the hosts don't disappear, we're, we're OK. We'll work with it and people can always email us directly. So. <laughs> Yeah, so do keep the comments coming. If your comment doesn't appear, let's say within a few hours, send it again. Keep trying. Get those comments through. So thank you for that. Also, once again, thank you in acknowledging the other person who did correct me on this uh, mis Mr. Man issue as well. So thank you as well for pointing that out. OK, here's, here's an interesting one, James. A little bit of a rabbit hole that we mustn't go down too far. Let me check, says, the attack of 9-11 was masterminded by Raw. Now, this is a new one on me. Hear me out. After the, uh, the Kanishka air crash, of course, the Air India, um, Canada uh, bombing, Sikh freedom movement got labelled as a terrorist uh, act. But after 9-11, who was the soft target? Uh, only one picture of Osama bin Laden was every news outlet that there was. He's wearing a turban. So who are the real beneficiaries if Sikhs got killed in the West? I think this is, oh, I, I love a good conspiracy theory. I, I really rub my hands with it with anticipation about a conspiracy theory. 9-11 is the mother of all conspiracy theories. You can pick one at your choice. There are millions to choose from. Here's a new one from Let Me Check, James. Ah, woo, were, was, was, was somebody else behind this? Really, were six, was the Sikh community the real uh, indirect target of 9-11 to try and uh, create hatred against the Sikh community? That's a new one on me, James. I think that the, uh, the photo itself wasn't so much just the turban, but it was just the image of itself that really gave a uh, sinister look to him. And, of course, the uh, American public and the general public really uh, fed into the turban part instead of the eyes and the, and the expressions and that. And I think that's where you're going with that is that it really was, um, uh, it really did have a spin-off effect that people took their frustration, their anger, their fear out on the six and it, they shouldn't have. But I do agree that the media could have uh, used other images that didn't so much uh, try to uh, put him with that with that uh, community group. So, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll never dismiss a conspiracy theory because quite often, as life has proved, life can be stranger than fiction. The truth can be stranger than fiction. So who knows? But unfortunately, I don't. Th I, my personally, uh, uh, my personal opinion, I don't think Raw were behind this. Raw certainly, we are fully aware, are capable of some pretty. Uh, interesting, let's say, um, uh, methods to, to further their agenda, Air India being a, a prime example of that. I think, well, if, if they were behind 9-11, um, unfortunately, the effect has not really worked because, in fact, uh, the US invaded Afghanistan, Iraq on the back of that. So clearly it may backfired in the wrong direction. Yeah, and I definitely were, don't agree that uh, Ra had any anything to do with it whatsoever. As I said, I think that it was just a photo that was used that, unfortunately, uh, people focused on the turban instead of the evil looking eyes and just the cold deathless expression on his face, I think, is uh, where I'm going with that. But not, no, I don't agree that Raw was involved. But hey, you know, conspiracy theories can be uh, educational, if not entertaining. Yeah, great comment anyway. So th thank you for that comment. Now, Joe or I, I love this one. Now, James, we have been, firstly, we've talked about doing our show in Khalistan. We've been suggested maybe the Khalistan Broadcasting Corporation. But Joe or I has put us one step further, even suggested that we become part of the government of Khalistan. What a fabulous idea. I'm up for it, as long as I'm democratically elected. 
I will I will come over and work in the media, but I'll leave the politics to those who uh, that have more hair than I because I'm losing it already, and I'd end up pulling it out with the stress <laughs> of politics. <laughs> So thank you, Joe Arai, for that suggestion. It, um, well, let, let's see. Let's cross that bridge when it comes. I, I do, right. lo I do uh, love Jasmine the thought, though. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jasmin de Singh says, Victim 6 uh, asking for Khalistan are being labelled as terrorists. Yes, absolutely. They are regularly. And it is a, a mislabel. It is misinformation. And, um, yeah, it's appalling. And you go as far as to suggest that if all the six living in the diaspora should file a lawsuit in the international court. <sighs> Is it possible? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. But certainly, I think, uh, yes, I mean, people like Gurpur Trant Singh Panoon and others, even, even the estate of Najjar, for example, but plus many others, who are officially, according to India, labelled as terrorists, I would call that as defamation, because certainly there's not enough proof that's been presented in any, certainly any Western court, James. I, well, who knows? Maybe there is a court case in there. Well, and I do believe that uh, it could be handled within a civil litigation uh, to the home country of the individual. So if they're Americans or Canadians, they could file suit. There's very limited uh, a scope that you can do that with. But you also have to look at whether or not India is a signatory or that they actually recognize the force and uh, the force majeure of the international court as it may come to this type of, uh, of litigation. So it's a very interesting question, something we'll have to look into. Yeah, I mean, even following Panoon's example of, of launching a civil case in the U.S. courts, um, could the U.S. diaspora launch a civil case similarly against in India for defamation? That's a, a law that uh, India has used against, for example, Rahul Gandhi, uh, amongst many others, to, to silence its political dissidents or its political opponents. So maybe, yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept. Maybe there's a defamation case. You've labelled us a terrorist. We're not terrorists. Prove it in a U.S. court of law. If they win that case... OK, it's going to achieve nothing in terms of financial compensation. I think it's unlikely that India's going to pay up. But again, like the Panoon case, it's all about raising awareness. It's raising the profile. We're not terrorists. Prove it. Uh, and yeah, see what that's, uh, that could open up an interesting conversation. So thank you for that comment. 1S, 1N2. Uh, back to the flag burning, James. Yeah, very, very emotive subject, this. Um, but 1S12 uh, casts a sign, a, 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 a warning of um, caution about it. It's important to challenge and show defiance. I'm not sure if burning flags under the circumstances is a disease. It can be counterproductive also. Yeah, there's a different perspective on this. Of course, burning flags is, is a is a go to um, is a go to protest around the world. I mean, we we see it on our, our news channels on an almost daily basis. I think every, every nation's flag has been burnt at one stage in protest by somebody. Um, but one S one and two says it can be counterproductive. Cruella wades in and says burning flag is the first step in any fight. Hmm, interesting. I'll come on to Ashley Kandar's comments in a second, James. But yeah, James, your thoughts on burning flags? <coughs> Do you know, I've got uh, the clip here from the, uh, from the protest last week in Vancouver. And of course, this is what they're referring to is the burning of the flag. Now, in this particular scene here, uh, if you stop sharing for a quick second, Angus, I'll just pull up a quick shot of the individual here. And we'll just do this really quick because we are running out of time here. But I just wanted to show a picture of the individual. Now, this guy here was uh, escorted from the protest in downtown Vancouver in front of the India consulate. And the reason why they removed this individual, because he tried to take one of the flags and run off and basically steal uh, the flag from the protesters. And you can go back to sharing if you'd like, Angus. Uh, so, yeah, the whole issue is that they took him, they uh, escorted him away to calm the situation. Um, when it comes to burning flags, that, again, is a polarizing issue because I personally don't agree with burning flags. Um, I see a flag as representing every individual of a nation, not just the politicians. So I find my personal opinion is that burning flags is an insult to the whole nation, not just the political end. But I also do understand the power of burning a flag when it comes to the protest and to gather attention. 
and uh, to really etch a uh, an image in someone's mind. So, but again, for me, no, I personally don't agree with burning flags because, as I said, it represents a whole group of people, not just uh, the political group. So, that's my opinion on it. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> actually, Kandar has an opinion on it, and he says, "But these people look like illegals." Well, I, I saw this comment and thought, mm, okay, that's a bit of a, a provocative comment. Um, you know, slightly right wing, you know, where's that come from? But actually, I, and I think the, the clue comes in his, his other comment, which is a little bit further down. And he says, how much are the Calistanis paying these white heroes? Well, I think, I think that refers to us, James. Apparently, we're being paid with some sort of mercenaries standing up for Calistan. I mean, well, let me just say to Mr. Ashley Kandar, believe it or not, it is possible that there are others outside the Sikh diaspora and the Sikh community who actually feel quite strongly about human rights, who actually do recognise what's going on in India, who do question this whole concept of Indian democracy when news filters out of what actually is going on in India and the dreadful oppression. Those of us who were alive and quite aware in 1984 when the dreadful news reports came out uh, from the Punjab in Amritsar and the Golden Temple, the absolutely shocking outrage and the genocides that followed in 1984. Yes, actually, believe it or not, there are those of us who Yes, thank you for calling us heroes, who are quite happy to stand up in front of a camera and report on things like this because we fight injustice because it happens to be our principles. What are your principles, Ashley Kandar, I wonder? Because clearly you don't, uh, you don't agree with uh, many of our audience on here and you have absolutely the democratic right, wherever you may reside, to contradict and criticise us. But unfortunately, um, when it comes to paying heroes like us, we do this because we are motivated by simple principles, normal democratic principles and the rights of human beings the world over. And we will fight for that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can call us heroes if you like, and thank you for calling us heroes. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, uh, Ashley Kandar, um, we will continue to do this because we are motivated by our principles. That's what it boils down to. Are you, Ashley Kandar? <laughs> James, sure you got some thoughts on that one. Oh, absolutely. And when you look back to 1984, but also 1985 with the uh, terroristic attacks on the flight uh, for Air India, a lot of the, uh, the whole investigation took place in the community in which I live in. This, you know, I live in Metro Vancouver. This is where a lot of the, uh, a lot of the investigation took place. This is where people were arrested. This is a community that lost... Um, not just uh, Canadians, but uh, nationals from around the world. And, and, you know, Indians, Canadians, Europeans. I mean, people lost their lives. Families were forever altered. The grieving is just never ending for a lot. And that means that we need the truth about what happened. I am not 100% convinced that the people that were charged were actually the ones guilty. I would like to see a full investigation into it again so that everybody can get the truth, lay it to rest, and move forward with the healing process. Until that's done, I don't know that it's going to happen. So, of course, we stand up for human rights of all peoples around the world, the right to democracy, the right to express an opinion. And uh, whether you like our opinion or not, I thank you for watching the show and taking the time to comment on, our, uh, on the comment section. Indeed. And, and also, uh, I mean, James, of course, you, you've got the, uh, you know, you've got a very large Canadian diaspora um, uh, and the Air India. So there's, there's a huge amount affecting the Canadian diaspora. Here in the UK, um, <clears throat> I have regularly pointed out why, why am I so motivated towards supporting the concept of Khalistan, apart from just the human rights issue and just a simple democratic self-determination. Um, it's also because of the British Empire. Because, yeah, the, uh, you know, Great Britain had an empire. We came up against the Sikh Empire. We defeated it, only just, I might add. Um, but we respected, we learned to respect the Sikh community and the Sikh Empire, the Sikh soldiers that we came up against. And uh, we absorbed them into the British Empire. However, we have since betrayed them, despite 
the, uh, the massive contribution that the Sikh community has made since the 19th century to Great Britain on every level, particularly in our armed forces. And now here at home, we have a, a fantastically successful diaspora here in the UK. And as I've said on many occasions, I feel the best compensation for that betrayal is to give the Sikh community back its homeland give back what we took from them in the 19th century. It's a very simple principle. It's nothing more than that. So I will continue from, from a British perspective to fight for what I feel is genuine compensation for what the British Empire took away from the Sikh community, from the Sikh, from the Sikh people, is to give them back their empire, essentially their own homeland. <clears throat> and that is what I will continue to do. So on that point, James, let us move on. Otherwise, we really will run out of time. So. So our final set of comments, and uh, Hat B says, Six in Indian government are not allowed to say so much, and what they do say is ignored. Yeah, this comes back to, yeah, the six, um, we talk again, the, the whole uh, fake six discussion that we've had. There are many, as many uh, people have pointed out, so people have pointed out, look, there are six, uh, oh, it comes back to that propaganda piece, James, that we did. Uh, where they said, oh, six are in high levels of government, they're in the police forces, etc. Yeah, but they're not allowed to say so much and what they do say is ignored. Yeah, they are given these token places, but how much actual influence do they have in their overall running of India and the infrastructure of India and society, etc.? Probably not very much. So again, it's all about, well, we'll give them a little, just enough to say, yeah, they've got representation, but in fact, their voice is not just diluted, it is ignored. So it's a very subtle nuance there, and Hatby, I think, rightly points out this, this nuance in, uh, and it counteracts that propaganda piece from the other day, where, yeah, six are in piece, uh, places of government and law enforcement and politics, etc. But actually, does it make any difference? Probably not. Zero Tolerance says, watching from India. Very good news program here in India. We don't hear anything what you guys are saying. Keep it up. Absolutely, Zero Tolerance, thank you for pointing this out. Spread the good word. It is absolutely true that we are banned uh, in India for very good reason because we are telling it like it is. We are telling what many Indians are not hearing. We're telling telling you the real truth out there that it is being hidden from you in India. So thank you for pointing that out. And as I always say to our, our listeners and our watchers in India, spread the good word, get others around. Let people in India know about Satellite TV so they can actually hear the same message. And finally, to wrap up the show, I love this comment from Harjit Rosha. Hello, James and Angus. Greetings and greetings to you. I always get refreshed after watching your show. I don't need vitamins anymore. God bless you both richly. James, we are a vitamin. We are vitamin sat lunch. <laughs> what a wonderful message. I'm just glad that they were referring us to uh, vitamins and not Viagra, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep it up, as they say. <laughs> on, that, on that note, <laughs> let us quickly wrap up the show. But uh, yeah, thank you for that comment. Lovely comment. And again, a, a general thank you to all of you, uh, all of you who've sent comments in. There have been some really lovely complimentary comments. We do read them. And even if they don't make the comment section, it's only because uh, we obviously pick uh, talking points. Um, uh, topics that we can obviously discuss and of course many of the complimentary comments are, are just lovely just to receive anyway uh, they're not talking points as such but it, this is a general blanket thank you to each and every one of you who have sent some really really kind uh, and, and very uh, appreciative comments we do read them and they really do have a, such a positive impact on James and myself so thank you very much indeed for those but unfortunately uh, we have been beaten by time massively as always and we must wrap things up but of course you have been watching Perspectives don't forget to keep those comments coming in uh, we do appreciate them and of course you can email us directly at message at satledgetv.com if there's anything you'd like to bring to our attention that you don't want to put in the public domain. But in the meantime, it is a goodbye from me and it is a goodbye from James. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. You have been watching Perspectives. We will see you next time.